So now we can put all those components together and we can start to think about what the actual algorithm is that could generate a decision tree. And the, the first algorithm that was suggested is called the ID3 decision tree algorithm. Um, and it begins by assuming that the attributes are discrete or that they have been discretized, right? And this is important, right? Because what we need to do is we need to choose both an attribute but also all the attribute values associated with it and split on those things, right? And so as a result, if it's real valued, we keep splitting and splitting and splitting and splitting. We can't stop. Now, there are solutions to this problem that have been discovered, right? You don't have to split on every attribute value pair that's possible, right? You can split on some subset of them, but the original algorithm didn't do that. So what it did was you assume that the attributes are discrete. You choose the attribute with the highest information gain. You then create branches for each value of that attribute, right? And you partition out the examples among the branches the way we were describing. And you keep repeating this until all the examples at the leaf nodes have the same label or there's no examples left to partition out, right? And that was the original algorithm. Now, the problem, that problem, algorithm had many problems, as you might said. It's extremely expensive, right? You got to check every single different one, right? It overfits. And what do we mean by overfits? Well, it's going to put every single example of a previous customer you've seen to a particular tree node. So if you have one crazy customer whose features don't match any of your other customers, it's gonna find a way to put them into that um, matrix, right? That, that decision tree, right? And so it's gonna fit the training data too well. Um, pruning can help this, right? You can cut back um, and the leaves, right? You can cut back some of the decisions. So rather than going all the way down to the very bottom, you can go up a level. Right? So you don't make that last decision point, but just leave the classes kind of mixed at the previous uh, decision point. Uh, and there's an algorithm called C4.5 that was an extension to ID3 that specifically helped with overfitting. Now, what we're going to be using in uh, the R Studio when we get to that example is we're going to be using something called R part, which implements uh, some of these more advanced algorithms, as you can see. So here is kind of what it puts out, right? So it shows the results at the top that 3,164, seven are um, yes, no's, 1840 are yeses, and it gives you know the probabilities of each of those occurring. And then it splits first based upon duration. If it's less than 474.5, right, then, it, then you still wind up with 27,481, right? And you see all these splits along the way. And in fact, there's only one split where it recommends labeling or two splits sorry where it recommends labeling something yes and they have a lot to do with their ration and one of the interesting things about decision trees is anyone can quickly look at this and see what variables are most important first of all there's only two variables that it's even splitting on duration and month right and so those are the two that seem that this decision tree has determined are the most important and then it's interesting that it goes into all these different little nooks and crannies of how to um, split on those different things. And essentially this winds up with two major splits. This one is driven only entirely by duration. Essentially saying if the person talked to whoever contacted them the last time for more than uh, 888.5, which I've got to assume is seconds and not minutes, right? Um, then they are almost surely going to accept the offer. So if they were talked to the, the, the previous telemarketer who reached out to them, for more than, you know, what is it, 900 seconds, that's that's a lot, that's like 15 minutes, then they're gonna accept this offer, right? On the other hand, this other one basically goes down a set of path that narrows down what month it is, and if it is in March or October, right, and they've talked to them for a long time in the past, only 105 seconds, so that's only, you know, a couple of minutes, right? Then they are likely to say yes, right? So that's the two paths it winds up generating. And this is a visualization of that graph. So our part gives you this naturally and we'll show how to create that in the R aspect. We can also create the confusion matrix. Now you saw the confusion matrix in session uh, two, but I didn't call it that specifically, right? Uh, but that's essentially what it is because it shows you what the actual values are, right? And what the predictions are. And in this case, um, this decision tree mislabels um, 522 no's as yeses and 1102 um, yeses as no's, right? Um, and that's on the training data, right? Which is always important to see, right? So you can see it. And then this is on the testing data. And it, it looks like it's pretty similar. Maybe, no, it's a little worse, but it's not, it, it's similar in terms of its overall performance. The reason why I say it's a little worse is because I know that these numbers are smaller. So that 460 versus the 522 
means it's almost the same, and so it's obviously mislabeling more in this one because the percentage has gone up. Now, there's an extension to uh, decision trees called random forest, which is a really cool idea that came out in 2001. Uh, the original decision tree algorithm goes back quite a ways, um, so it's been around for a while. But Breeman discovered or described this random forest algorithm in 2001. So here's the idea. You repeat k times, and k is usually pretty large, like 1,000 or 10,000 or something like that. You draw a bootstrap sample from the data set. In other words, from your training data, you pick some examples. You don't pick all of them, but you pick, say, 50% or 30% of them, right? You then train a decision tree just on those examples until you reach some max size, right? Um, and you keep splitting on these attributes, right? Um, and you measure how well that decision tree does on the samples that were not in the bootstrap, right? And so what that tells you is that tells you how good this tree is in general across your whole training data. This gives you a measure of strength of this error, right? You're also gonna measure the correlation between the trees, like how often do they misclassify the same examples over time? And that's gonna give you a measure called the forest error rate, right? Now, when you see an unknown example that you've done this, so now you have a thousand trees, right, that all have, you know roughly how strong they are because you know how well they did at, at classifying things they didn't see. You then make a prediction by the majority vote among the K trees. And in some cases, you take the measure of strength into account, right, to uh, amplify those who did it. But the nice thing about this, right, um, and one important point I forgot is that when you split each of the nodes, you don't split across all the attributes, you don't choose across all of them, you just select a set of attributes that you're going to split at randomly. So not only are you training these trees on a random set of data, you're also training each of the splits on a random set of the features that are available at that split, right? So the nice thing about this is you get kind of this implicit generalization to data that you can't see because the tree has never actually seen that data, right? Hasn't seen all those attributes, hasn't seen all those examples. And so it's doing its best it can with weaker information, but when we put them all together, right, we get the best possible prediction across all of them as a whole. It's kind of a wisdom of the crowds type approach to decision trees. Now, the problem with random forests is that they're difficult to interpret, but luckily, you know, they came up with a good solution, which is variable importance. And so here's how variable importance works. So um, I'm going to take the var values of a variable and I'm going to scramble them, right? And if I scramble the values of that variable and I run the random forest on it and the accuracy of the forest doesn't change very much, right? then that variable is not important to the way the random forest makes decisions, right? So I can measure how much error I get when I use my training data as is versus how much error I get when I scramble that particular variable and I can measure the difference between that and that tells us how important that variable is. Now, this is a really cool idea because as you can imagine, decision trees were really nice and easy to interpret, but if I have a thousand of them, it's really hard to interpret them. So this gives me a quick way to summarize how much each variable affects the overall decision paths that the random forest is taking, right? Random forests also are really nice because they're super easily parallelizable for big data, right? You can think about it, I because I'm doing a subsample of the data, I can train these trees on different CPUs and different clusters all over the space. I don't really need all the data to be all be in one space. So if I have, you know, on the order of petabytes of data, right, I can partition them out and build little random forests on each of them, bring them back together and kind of uh, build a gigantic classifier on the whole thing, right? Um, and so when we run the random forest uh, setup on the data, right, for the bank telemarketing, we get these nice uh, measures of uh, how well the random forest fits the data. And this shows us, when we do the variable importance measure, how much the accuracy, how much the error rate decreases. Another way you could think about it also, right, is how much it affects the decrease in the Gini coefficient through the various classification stages, right? But let's focus on the accuracy, right? And so duration winds up, that duration variable of the previous call winds up being the most important. Month is the second most important. That's similar to what we saw in the decision tree. And then age and then previous outcome. And previous outcome has almost no effect, so it's, it's not really that important, right? Um, 
you can then look at you know, you know we'll look at the confusion matrix for the random forest right and it's it's pretty good it's better than it was for on the training data for the decision tree right that we saw before and we can look at the testing data and you know maybe that's not great but it's at least around eh, maybe not uh, 25 six one try so maybe maybe about the same as the decision tree so it's not doing great but it's you know we're we're, we're still getting uh, some um, a decent classifier out of it so that's the basic idea between behind random forests and the next in random tree in decision trees and all this kind of stuff and in the next section we're going to split to an entirely different topic and start talking about evolutionary computation